Well, thank you. It's such a joy to be with you here today at this great school, the Beeson Divinity School. You know, when I think about this issue that I've been asked to talk about, about work and the gospel as it relates to work, I always think of a man that I used to know. It'd be wrong for me to call him a friend because we never had a conversation that went more than two or three minutes. Probably be wrong to even call him an acquaintance because I'm not sure that I ever even knew his name. And I'm pretty sure he never knew my name. He always just called me Buddy. But I was working my way through seminary at a box factory. Go in every day. No one would talk to each other because the the factory was so loud with the the sounds of machines and everyone was wearing earplugs. And we would work doing the same thing every day, putting these boxes together. And then the bell would ring and everyone would file out and leave. And there's one particular guy, we'd always have a conversation as we're walking out. And I'd say, how are you doing? He said, I'm waiting till Friday, and then I'm going to get smashed. The next day, how you doing? Buddy, I'm waiting till Friday, and I'm going to get drunk. Next day, how you doing? I'm waiting until Friday, and I'm going to get blitzed. And I just was kind of waiting every day for whatever new word he would come up with to describe the fact that he was going to drink a lot of alcohol uh, that weekend. None of this was shocking or alarming to me. I'd listened to enough classic country music all of my life that I really wasn't shocked by drinking and cheating and honky-tonking, hearing it coming from him. But he kept doing this until one day he said, now, what's your story? What are you doing? I said, well, I'm over at the Baptist Seminary preparing to be a pastor. He said, oh. He said, so you, you probably can't get drunk, can you? I said, well, I think I could if I tried but I'd probably get in a lot of trouble. And so we started talking about it. He said, you know what? I couldn't do this job if I couldn't, as soon as I left on Friday, just started, start drinking until I'm just gone for the rest of the weekend. And I said, well, why? He said, well, think about it. He said, I've been doing this job now for 20 years. And every single day I come in and I do the exact same thing. And then I go home every day. He said, I'm glad to do it. It makes a living for my family. He said, but in order to get by and in order to do that, I've got to know that at the end of the week, I can escape from everything and not even have to remember that I've got to come back to this box factory on Monday. As I walked away from that, I realized there was something about the drudgery of that job, the the sameness, everydayness of that job that caused this man to think that there had to be a means of escape. And at the time, I assumed that the problem was that job. I assumed that the problem was it's just that this job is so hard and it's just that there's not a a relational connection with other people there and it's because he doesn't have any prospects of ever leaving that job and going to a different job. That's the reason why he feels that he has to escape. But as the years have gone by, I've started to realize that there comes a point in every job, in every vocation, in every kind of work, where the exact same thing starts to happen. Even in those jobs that are constantly changing, and even in those jobs that the rest of the world would consider to be glamorous, there comes a point in a life in which a person says, everything that I was going to do, I've done. And everything that I am doing, what is it ultimately going to matter? And so there are some people who escape from the drudgery of their work lives through substance abuse or through other things. There are other people who seek to escape from that sense of meaninglessness by throwing themselves even harder into their work? Is there a way to somehow form meaning by doing what I've been doing, but doing it better and doing it with more energy and doing it with more success? What if at the end of all of this, nothing that I'm doing is going to last or matter whether that is putting boxes together or whether that is writing poems and making films. I think you and I, if we are going to be the sort of church 
that casts a vision for work, we are going to have to be the sort of people who understand meaning the way that Jesus defined it. And that meaning has to be defined by what Jesus said that we are to seek first above everything else, and that is the kingdom of God. That's what this conversation is about that Jesus is having with his disciples that was read just a few minutes ago. We tend to hear this passage of Scripture, and we're very familiar with this, about Jesus saying that the one who leads is the one who must serve. But we tend to apply that simply in terms of life within the church or simply in terms of our psychological attitude toward others around us. But that message has everything to do with work. And not just with the work of those who've been called to gospel ministry. It has everything to do with the work that the people who make up the entire body of Christ have been called to. And this is how. Notice, first of all, that what Jesus is doing is creating meaning by reshaping the future. Jesus here is talking about the kingdom to his disciples. He's talking about this question of which one of you is the greatest, the argument that is happening. Notice what the argument is. This, this isn't a sort of boasting contest going on between the disciples. When they're talking in terms of greatest, they are talking about the very same sort of thing in embryo that my co-laborer at that box factory is talking about. Does this matter? How can I tell the difference between the boxes I made yesterday from the boxes that I'll make tomorrow from the boxes that I'll make 20 years from now? What difference does my life make? And the disciples are talking about greatness, not a greatness probably that inherit in them, but a greatness that they have within the kingdom that Jesus is promising. Who is going to have authority? And Jesus comes in and disrupts this argument by presenting a picture of the future that is supposed to change the way that they see the present. He says, don't you know that those of you who have stayed with me in my trials, don't you know that you will rule and reign with me judging over the 12 tribes of Israel? Jesus here, when he is looking toward the future, is not looking toward a static existence of gazing into a light. One of the reasons that we have to press so much of our identity into our vocations, which always disappoints, and one of the reasons that many become so discouraged in their vocations, always to disappoint, is because they assume that they have a lifespan, even those who are Christians, assume that they have a lifespan of 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years. So the meaning that I have to attain has to happen in what I am doing in this calling, in this vocation right now. Now, at the beginning of a life, that can seem as though it would infuse more meaning into your work. This is all I've got. I've got to make my mark. I've got to do what I have to do. But as time goes on, it tends to have the exact opposite effect. As we come up against the vastness of cosmic history, against our own weakness and our own mortality, if all of our meaning is there in whether or not I am the best preacher or whether or not I am the best plumber or whether or not I am the best attorney or whether or not I am the best mother, whatever it is, it starts to drag us into despair 
And the problem is that we see our lives, as Jesus is pointing out to the disciples here, exactly as the pagans do, except with heaven at the end. We even talk that way. We speak about an afterlife. Think of what your marriage would be like if you thought of your marriage as your afterlove. The very word suggests that our life is over and now we are in another phase of afterlife. So that we have this image that somehow the kingdom that we have been called into is the equivalent of some sort of a high school reunion, which can be a lot of fun. If you gather together at a high school reunion, that can be a great time for three or four hours. Remember that time when we did this? Remember when that happened? Hey, whatever happened to so-and-so? What's she doing now? But you can't do that for four trillion years. And if we think of our future as an afterlife in which we are simply reflecting back on what happened in this brief vapor of time, then that gives a sort of desperation to making sure that our lives and our work and our vocations are going to matter, not only in terms of establishing the way that we look to the people around us, but because really it is the frame for our eternal existence. But that's not the kingdom that Jesus is talking about. He's talking about an inheritance. And an inheritance in a biblical understanding of the word isn't a transfer of money from one bank account to another. An inheritance is a vocation, a calling. You don't have high school guidance counselors in first century Galilee. You know what you're going to do on the basis of what your father did. And the inheritance that a father left for his son is typically not a sum of money, but a plot of land or a seafood business or a carpentry shop. He has cultivated, he has built that work, and then he leaves it for another generation to pick up and to continue. The kingdom of God is that sort of an inheritance. Jesus says, as my father has assigned to me a kingdom, so I assign it to you. And the kingdom that Jesus is leading is not a kingdom of idleness and of a lack of activity. His kingdom is dynamic. It is on a mission. It is ongoing. And Jesus says, I am giving you this kingdom, assigning to you this kingdom so that you will eat with me at the table. Relationships continue. And not simply relationships that are looking back on relationships that were once present as though they are frozen in amber, but relationships that continue with a work and a mission that continues. You will rule with me judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Judging is an active life of taking, making decisions and implementing processes. Jesus says, you have a life in front of you that is a life that is about mission and purpose and work. So why are we so focused on making sure that we are great, making sure that we have maximum impact, making sure that we are known in this short period of time if in reality what we have in front of us isn't 70, 80, 90, 100 years, or even just the memory of us for another 100 or 1,000 years, but we have trillions and trillions and trillions of years of activity in front of us. The, the life that we have waiting for us overshadows 
and helps us to put into perspective the work that we are given now, regardless of what the work it is that God has called us to. But he doesn't just do that. Jesus doesn't just reshape the present. He reshapes the future. He says, you all are acting like Gentiles. That is the worst thing you could possibly say to these people of God. You are acting just like the Romans who exercise lordship over one another. But don't you know that the last shall be first and the first shall be last? Jesus is not putting some dichotomy between servanthood and leadership. He is saying that leadership comes through the one who is other-directed, the one who is serving. He says, I am not calling you to be little Pharaohs or little Caesars. I am calling you to be Christians, to serve and to reign in the way that I serve and reign, in Christ, not with raw sovereignty, not with power plays, which are easy to do, in the Oval Office, and they're easy to do in the Walmart break room. He says, I'm calling you to a different sort of rule, and the activity that is happening right now, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. As he says elsewhere, those who have shown responsibility in little things will be given responsibility over many things. That's the reason why Jesus makes a connection between their lives as they were. You are fishermen. This is not irrelevant. I will make you to be fishers of men. There is something about the lives that we are leading, including our work lives, that the scripture tells us is not accidental. All things work together Romans 8, 28, for the good. That doesn't just mean what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. He says, in order to conform us to the image of Christ so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. The workplaces and callings of the people in our congregations are not random accidents. God has placed and put people in the arenas where he has put them for a reason. And the reason is not simply about what is happening at that moment in that job. It is because everything that is happening right now is an internship for the eschaton. We are learning and preparing in the way that we lead in small things in the way that we serve in small things, in the way that we cultivate humility, in the way that we cultivate wisdom, in the way that we cultivate courage, in order to be prepared for something else that is coming that right now we could not understand if it were described to us. We are learning by serving, we are learning by working in order to be rulers. David learns to be a ruler over Israel not by going to a university for future Middle Eastern monarchs. He learns to be a ruler over Israel by being a sheep herder and by, as he says, fighting off a lion and fighting off a bear from the sheep in order to prepare him to be able to rule over and to fight for his people. Solomon learns to be a ruler over Israel by asking as a little child for the wisdom to be able to judge this great people, a wisdom that starts in small decisions and then continues on into great decisions. The life of Jesus does not start with him descending from heaven in a burst of energy as a full-grown adult. It starts in Luke 2 with Jesus submitting to his father and mother in everything and growing in favor with God and with man. Jesus is being prepared in his humanity 
to be the king of the universe as a three-year-old little boy in, in, in Egypt learning to say the Shema. You and I are following Christ in the exact same way. We learn in the little things, things that we might not even be able to see how God in the fullness of time will use those things in a resurrection life with an assignment and with a calling that he is giving to us to carry out. And that happens also within the church. Jesus says, the one who serves is the one who leads. We don't follow by the Gentile pyramid scheme. We don't follow by the Gentile organizational chart. He says, within the church, the one who leads serves, and the one who serves leads. What he is saying there is not simply that within the church, everything is of value in some condescending sort of a way so that we say to people, you know, the fact that you're handing out the bulletins, that really is of great value to our church. You really are just as important as somebody who's preaching the word with a sort of pat on the head. Not at all. Jesus is saying something far more radical than that. He's saying through the Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, that the gifts of the church and the varieties of gifts within the church are a sign of the kingdom of Christ advancing. He says it is a sign of the one who has led captivity captive and has given gifts to men. So that the work that is being done during the work week, preparing those individuals for their future rules in the kingdom of God, and that work that is being done together within the congregation, working harmoniously in all of these various sorts of ways, are a sign, this is in miniature, a movie trailer of what it looks like when Jesus rules. And Jesus rules by staffing up his administration right now, equipping them with gifts, gifts that he will then magnify, gifts that he will then glorify, gifts that have a purpose that we cannot see and that we cannot know. So it is not just that every aspect of work has dignity because every aspect of work is needed. Although that's true. Every aspect of work has dignity because every aspect of work is preparatory. And every aspect of work is limited because every aspect of work is preparatory. Not only does a kingdom vision cause us to see that my job making these boxes in the providence of God is preparing me for a rule. My job here within this little church plant, setting up chairs and serving the rest of the body of Christ, is preparing me for rule. It is also in order to say that those who seek to find their identity in vocations that they consider to be great and glorious ought not to think so highly of those things. They are only preparatory. Who will care in the fullness of time who was employee of the month? Who will care after billions of years who was president of the United States when the Washington Monument is in ruins? All of these things are preparatory for a reign that is not yet seen, which ought to free us from despair. The work that we do isn't drudgery. It has meaning, even if we don't see what it is. And it also ought to free us from pride and from the sort of addiction to work for the sake of work that will drive us to the point of deifying ourselves. The only one in the New Testament 
who doesn't seem to have a Messiah complex is the actual Messiah. And he says, I'm preparing a kingdom for you. So live now as though the focus that you have is not the next 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years. You don't just live once. You don't just have one shot at meaning. Live for the next trillion years and then some. Father, I pray for the men and women in this room. I pray for the callings that you have given to all of them as you send them forward. Father, I pray that you will give them through the power of the Spirit the ability to empower people in their congregations to be able to live as Christians in workplaces, to be able to serve and to be able to lead, whether the arena of that service and leadership is small by our definitions or large by our definition. Father, I pray that you will enable them to give a picture of a much bigger field of vision of the kingdom of God. And Father, would you help us? Would you help us from despair? And would you help us away from pride? Would you help us away from idleness and exhaustion? And would you help us away from obsession? Might we seek the kingdom and your righteousness and all of these things may be added to us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.